Kamala Harris has spent the last three weeks trying to get rid of all these crazy leftist policies that she used to have. She's lying now, saying, oh, you know what? I don't support banning fracking anymore. And she's flipping, lying to voters, saying she's changed all these radically left positions. Well, she just added Tim Walls to the ticket, who drags her all the way back to the left again. He reinforces all the things that she was just trying to escape from. The fact of the matter is, is there are people within his unit uh, who knew that they were going to be deployed to Iraq. And that's when Tim Waltz decided to get out of the military. There are previous articles that have been published that said that he served in Afghanistan. Now the press is trying to clean those up because that is factually untrue. In reality, he actually is very far to the left on anything from immigration to uh, gender mutilation for children, but that he seems like this nice Midwestern dad. Well, you're trying to serve me tofu that looks like ribeye, people aren't going to buy that. And this is another continuation of that same narrative. All right, guys, what a great show yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who shared the map 270. Wow. What a reaction we have gotten. Continue to share that, please. Uh, ask people to subscribe. Unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who do that. Uh, we will continue to update that map. What a shocking ending that was. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. I'm telling you, this could be a blowout for Trump or it could be a cliffhanger, but you have to see how this thing could play out if you didn't see it. And if you know someone who should see it, share it with them. Tomorrow, Michael Knowles from The Daily Wire, a great conversation ahead with him. They've got a lawsuit pending with Elon Musk that you're going to want to hear about. Today, though, the panel is all here. We're going to talk about these allegations against Tim Waltz, how the Trump campaign should message about them, plus Gen Z. Before I do that, as you know, these days can be very, very stressful, especially for Team Kamala, especially uh, if you're thinking about, should we be debating Donald Trump right now? But for 70 to 80% of Americans, they have real gut issues, not just stomach issues, real gut issues. I'm talking gas, bloating, constipation, you name it. Fortunately for them and all of us, there's a solution. Just Calm's exclusive all natural mood lifting blend is clinically proven to help you relax better and breathe a little easier in just four weeks. Plus, if you want to take it to the next level, join me in taking Just Thrive's probiotic. Now, a lot of you out there are probably like, I take a probiotic. Well, guess what? 99% of probiotics don't make it through the stomach to the intestine. They're not doing anything. They don't get you. Fortunately, Just Thrive's probiotic is a thousand times more effective and backed by more clinical research than anything else on the market. Plus, it helps you with uh, your healthy gut. That's not just your gut. That's mood, skin. Uh, overall things. I mean, there's a lot that comes with that. Uh, so if you haven't seen the episode I did with Tina, the founder, you've got to go back and watch it. But for a limited time right now, you can try Just Thrive's probiotic or Just Calm and save 20% on your first order. Just go to justthrivehealth.com, justthrivehealth.com, use promo code SPICER, justthrivehealth.com, use promo code SPICER. All right. As I said, a lot to get to. I want to bring in the panel, Kelly Sadler. She's the commentary editor at the Washington Times and a former uh, special assistant to President Trump in the Trump White House. Uh, Tim Murtoff, former communications director for the Trump 2020 White House. He's the author of the uh, Amazon bestseller. I love this book, Swing Hard, in case you uh, hit it. I loved it. It's such a personal story. Go get it. And then Trisha McLaughlin, a Republican strategist who formerly served as a senior advisor to Vivek Ramaswamy. Let's Let's bring the panel in. All right, guys, I want to just get your take on this. I, I've i been saying this for the last couple of days that I think this Tim Waltz accusation of stolen valor, military service is a vulnerability for him. So I just want to recap where we are for the audience. So we, we do this. There's four basic things that I think people are alleging about him and his service. Number one, the use of the title of command sergeant major. Okay. He was promoted to the title pending a few things, which he never made. And in his bio, he says, Command Sergeant Major retired. That is factually inaccurate. He retired at the lower grade. He had not earned it. We'll talk about that. Second, over and over again, and we'll play the clip in just a minute, he talks about banning guns like I used in combat. Well, he was never in combat. Three, uh, there's a question about whether or not whether when his unit deployed to Iraq, whether he abandoned them or not. We'll talk about the timeline. And then third, he talks about being a veteran of, of Operation Enduring Freedom. Again, more of a nuance here. He's a 
it's sort of like he was his orders probably were cut. We call them GWAT orders. They were meaning that he was part of OEF, uh, but clearly he never went to Afghanistan or Iraq. And is that playing fast and loose with the facts? All right, Tim, I want to start with you. Is this issue salient among people writ large, or is it confined to people uh, who have served in the military because they get it? Well, I think for sure that people who have served in the military get it. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. I think the jury is out on how much this is going to matter to people who did not serve in the military. I will tell you that I think that the Trump campaign, I think the signs are clear, the Trump campaign is going to make a significant issue of this. I know Chris Lasavita, who's a senior advisor at the Trump campaign, and he, he hired me for my first ever political job back in 1999 at the state party and uh, worked on the, the at George Allen U.S. Senate race in Virginia as the press secretary. And La Civita used to come to my door in my office with his Marine Corps sword and point it at me and say, who are we attacking today? And I'd be like, ah, you know, the opponent, sir. Right. So that was, that was 25 years ago. He has not lost any of that fighting no. edge and, and any of that fighting spirit. And they are going to hold Tim Walls's feet to the fire on this. I think that once you explain it to lay people, non-military people, they will get it. And I think especially the part where he stands up there, we'll see the clip where he said about the weapons I carried in war. Well, let's just pause well, for a second. Did Can not, I, I want to, yeah, let, let's just play that. Let, I want people to see what we're talking about. Can we put that uh, up and just show people what we're talking about? I've been voting for common sense legislation that protects the second amendment, but we can do background checks. We can do CDC research. We can make sure we don't have reciprocal carry among states. And we can make sure that those weapons of war that I carried in war is the only place where those weapons are at. Those weapons of war, which I carried and right. by his own admission, he never served in war. Is that a foot foul or is no. that a legitimate attack? That is absolutely a legitimate attack. He escalated. He's talking about banning guns and probably the government confiscation of guns. And he quite clearly made the choice to say that these are not guns that I would like to see in civilian use because I have used them in war and I know what they are for. They are for war because I have used them in the war, but he did not. So yes. Well, I think the irony is I would guess that he's carried a nine mil, which is a standard issue or, and probably an M4. Um, which is interesting because uh, a, I don't even know. I mean, I'm sure he probably trained on the M4, but I doubt that he ever carried it. Um, so Kelly, is that, I mean, I, I feel like, are we splitting hairs? Is the average voter out there? I mean, you guys, you at the Washington time, are you guys seeing this? Does anyone care? Or is this just a bunch of right wing military veterans that are like, this is ridiculous. No, people care because he's lying. And he's trying to use his military record uh, to his political advantage by leaving out key facts and omitting key references. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is there are people within his unit uh, who knew that they were going to be deployed to Iraq. And that's when Tim Waltz decided to get out of the military, to retire, to run for politics, because he did not want to take his team into Iraq. He did not want to deploy. Now the media is gonna to try to cover this up, uh, obscuvate the his actual record and the timeline here. But there are people within his unit that, and this is a new thing. And so what is crazy to me and boggles my mind is that Kamala Harris and the vetting team and Eric Holder looked at this and thought, no big deal, no big deal. Um, and it is a huge deal because his, his team and his, his campaign has alluded to the reference that he was in Afghanistan. There are previous articles that have been published that said that he served in Afghanistan. Now the press is trying to clean those up because that is factually untrue. So I think the fact that people can see very clearly that, you know, when it came his time to serve, he was basically, you know, the quarterback on a football team going into the Super Bowl. When he it was his time to serve, he said, uh uh, I'm gonna sit this one out. And everyone underneath him who looked at him for support being deployed to Iraq, uh basically he, he threw him under the bus so he could pursue his own political campaign. So I think this looks terrible. I think the Trump campaign is going to use it. Chris Lasavita is very famous for Swift Boat. Um, and so I see the ads already, but the more people that are, are paying attention to this, more people are made aware of it. They're like, this can't be, this can't be true. Is this real? Uh, but the right wing media is the only people that are reporting on this fact as of now. Trisha, does this issue have resonance with, with younger voters, do you think? Or are they like, I don't even know what you're talking about? 
I, I think it's the latter, Sean. I think that it, this is going to resonate in the fact of phoniness, that people feel, especially young people, that the Kamala Harris and now Tim Waltz campaign are not actually serving what they say they are. They're saying, you see a lot of the MSNBC, CNN analysts saying, oh, this guy has the style of a Midwestern moderate. In reality, he actually is very far to the left on anything from immigration to uh, gender mutilation for children, but that he seems like this nice Midwestern dad. Well, you're trying to serve me tofu that looks like ribeye. People aren't going to buy that. And this is another continuation <laughs> of that same narrative. That's a great, yeah, you know, and I think I think somebody touched on it here just a, a few minutes ago. I think there is no way that the Harris vetting team missed this. Yeah, they, no, absolutely. They identified this. This was an issue when he ran for governor It was an issue in his race when he ran for Congress. They knew about this. And I think, as as Kelly said, they decided it was not a big deal. That you is a huge what, indictment. Do you, of, do you think of that the they decided it wasn't a big deal or they didn't? Yeah. under? I, I think they just don't get it. They were like, oh, oh he, well, he answered this question. No, big deal. too. Yeah, I mean, that way may well be, too. They may have looked at it, didn't understand it, but thought they did, and then made a judgment that it was fine and to go ahead and proceed with Tim Walls. And in fact, they were wrong and didn't know uh, of their own ignorance on the subject. That's entirely possible. Yeah. Well, to yeah. Kevin's point earlier, who does get this is Chris Lacevito. What a full yes. circle campaign political moment that the guy who was behind yeah. Swift is now is now leading the leading. They served Trump. it up. You know, it also it also undermines Kamala Harris because, yeah, everybody's going to naturally focus on the VP candidate when the VP candidate is first announced. But Tim Walls has fast become over the last few days a pretty significant issue and not the top of the ticket. Now, some would say some would say that, oh, the Trump campaign should be focusing on Kamala Harris. And I think that's probably good advice, generally speaking, because she is the presidential candidate. However, she's being overshadowed. By her VP but pick, doesn't that not for a doesn't good this reason. go to her? But can't you pivot and say, "Look at the judgment she displayed." Exactly. Picked, yes, right, you have to apply it to her. You have to pivot you can't, back you to can't her. Can't forget. You can't forget that she is the main opponent. Walls has now become a detriment, and and uh, I think something that she has to drag around is a terrible choice. Well, so, I think right, I think it also demonstrates a level of arrogance that we rarely see in politics, especially within Republican circles, because we don't think we can get away with it. But the fact that the Kamala Harris campaign, they they must have known about that. They thought it's not a big deal. The American people won't care if he never actually served in Iraq. Um, we can put that on the resume and tout it as he's got over 25 years, you know, military experience and leverage that against J.D. Vance, an actual Marine who served in Iraq. It, it, right. it boggles it boggles my mind, but also the arrogance of just picking Tim Walsh and thinking he's just a white guy a Midwestern white guy and all those white people in the Midwest, all of those, you know, backward hillbilly Republicans will gravitate to him merely because of his skin color and, and, and where he's located in the United States of America. They didn't even consider his radical pro progressive stances on everything from giving illegal, you know, immigrants free health care um, and in college tuition to, you know, cutting down parental rights and allowing children to get gender mutilation surgery without the parental's parental consent. It's just to look at his record, you think, whoa, this guy is nowhere near the middle. Uh, but I think that Kamala Harris and her team just thought because he's white and from the Midwest, uh, then, you know, the average everyday American is going to buy the narrative that he is America's grandpa and just go with it. All right, guys, uh, I want to tell you, just as this ad interrupted this conversation, unfortunately, lots of things happen unexpectedly. And that's why I have a Patriot Power Generator 2000X in my house right here, right over there. Why? Because I want to be ready in the case of an emergency. And if you go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer, you can be too. Here's the thing. There's a lot of uh, generators on the market. Most of them are gas. I've had one. And when the power goes out, you have to hope that you have good gas because, you know, gas goes bad. Then you hope you can replenish it. You've got to have a gas station that's open near enough and time it out, right? Because those things only last for a few hours. The Patriot Power Generator 2000X runs completely on solar panels. And guess what? They come free with it. 
So you don't have to worry about that. Plus, you don't have to worry about the fumes and the noise. You can bring it in your house. You can power the most powerful things in your house, like your refrigerator, your TVs, your tablets, computers, medical devices. It's portable. You can keep it in your house, bring it to a friend's house, bring it to a family member's house. This is what you need in time of an emergency. Go to 4 slash Spicer and be ready in case of an emergency, a power outage, an attack on the electrical grid. You'll be ready. Everybody will love hanging out with you because you will have a Patriot Power Generator 2000X in your house. All right, let's get back to the panel. Yeah, and you know, it's it's inexplicable politically. Let me let me just squeeze in this one last thought, Sean, and then I'll shut up. Inexplicable polit- politically. Most time a candidate like Kamala Harris would, would name a VP who brings something to the table that she herself does not have. Like with right. Shapiro, yeah. what he brings to the table is probably Pennsylvania. You know, that's probably that's probably a good one. It's a huge <laughs> right? one. You know, that one that one was okay. But Kamala Harris has spent the last three weeks trying to get rid of all these crazy leftist policies that she used to have, right? These positions. She's lying now or she's doing it through staff really saying oh you know what i don't support banning fracking anymore and she's flipping lying to voters saying she's changed all these radically left positions well she just added tim walls to the ticket who drags her all the way back to the left again he reinforces all the things that she was just trying to escape from it makes no sense politically unless she really has a very serious problem with her left wing and if that's the case then she's in bigger trouble than they than they let on Yeah, all week long. I'm like, dude, you just gave us the biggest gift. This was the opportunity, the reset that we've been hoping happened. And you just handed it to us on a series. You're right. This is look around. Hey, what is this guy offer? Well, he brings Pennsylvania, maybe, but at least he brought something to the party. Something. Tim Waltz is now being an anchor. And you're right. I went from knowing nothing about Tim Waltz to he's a left wing lunatic that has issues and allegations of stolen valor. Not exactly a big thing. I want to ask you guys one last thing before we kind of move the discussion on. You brought up Chris LaCivita. He is the one of the two senior advisors leading the Trump campaign. He is a, as Tim puts out, he never lets you forget that he was a Marine. No. He led the effort to swift boat John Kerry. Okay, that all being said, should the campaign leave the attacks to Tim Waltz in his military service to J.D. Vance, who, as Kelly pointed out, served in Iraq in the Marine Corps as an enlisted Marine, Chris LaCivita, an enlisted Marine, and others, you know, the Derek Van Ordens, the congressman, uh, Nate, former Navy SEAL, and, and Mike Waltz, the former uh, Army officer from Florida, the congressman there, is opposed to Donald Trump trying to take shots at this. Is this one of those arguments it's better taken by people who've worn the uniform, or is it fair game for Trump? Tim? I mean, I think it, it, any, when anything, when you're attacking somebody on a specific resume point, it hel- it helps. It makes the attack stronger if you're attacking with people who can claim uh, more g- greater expertise with that particular bullet. So, yeah, I think so. I think you could also make an argument that it's not always the best idea for a guy who's been former president, who is a former president, to punch down and punch at the VP candidate himself in person. That said, I don't think that Donald Trump should never ever discuss it. I just think that the right. most pointed attacks are probably better best and most effective if they come from someone else. I think it's good for Donald Trump to go after the authenticity uh, argument. And this is part of it, right? Yeah, the stolen valor yeah. is is part of these people are saying that they're one thing and they're not. I mean, Tim Walsh also said that he was the head co- coach of a football team that went to the state finals. He was an assistant coach. Yeah, he these wasn't. things these things matter um, because these things matter to the American public because we're being lied to. Uh, these people are trying to present themselves, Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, as as middle of the earth. We're going to help you, you know, your pocketbooks. We're going to, you know, bat, they're they're trying to connect with us, but they're but they're you know they're sheep in wolves' clothing. Uh, there's yeah. wolves in sheep clothing. Sorry, I got that one backwards. But you know what I'm saying is 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 that they're trying to to lie to us. The press is not asking them any questions. They're not doing any press conferences. Uh, they they're trying to basically gaslight us up until election day and after. I've got to agree with them. I think don't punch down. But I think that being said. Donald Trump, what he didn't have in 2016, what he didn't have in 2020, he has now. He has an attack dog in J.D. Vance. Let J.D. Vance be that attack dog on this issues and on other issues. Transcend. Talk about the economy. Talk about all your economic accomplishments, because that is a top issue to voters. And neither Kamala Harris nor Tim Waltz have ever 
served outside of a government position. They've never served in the private sector. How are they going to fix the economy? How are they going to slow down inflation? How are they going to create jobs? They can't answer that question. I just yeah, one, point, one, one point on uh, what Kelly just said, I think it's talking about authenticity. The high school football thing is kind of a big deal, I think, yeah. depending on what kind of the, the a media or you've talked to a reporter about this reporter will probably say, oh, come on, you're nitpicking head football coach. Uh, assistant football. He was a coordinator. What's the difference? It's high school football. Let me tell you, and the, most of these are red states like Texas or Florida, but where high school football is king, Sean, and you know, there are places across the country where that is absolutely a fact. Friday night lights. We all know what that is, right? If you say, oh, I coached a team to the state championship, people think they assume you're talking about you were the head coach. Yeah. And then you, when you find out that, oh, no, he was actually just a coordinator. He was not the head coach. Then people go, oh, well, well I mean, you know, the you funny thing it matters in Pennsylvania. For example, I know. And the funny part know? is it's not, but it, I, I go back to something that, that you guys brought up before. Right. And and I agree with you. I read this thing and he talks about, you know, the team was Owen 27 or something, whatever. And then the two years later, three years later, he brought it to the state championship. I'm <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. And then I find out. And again, why do you have to, here's my point in this. Why are you lying? Like, why can't you just say I was part of a team that did this? I helped turn this team around. Help. That's great. Why is it that all of these things, it goes to the larger point of authenticity, flip-flopping, phoniness, which is, I mean, I think that's probably why Kamala chose him. She's like, hey, this guy's just like me. He'll <laughs> say and do anything he needs to. The I agree with you guys. Narratives. There's a broader narrative, which is that he will say and do whatever it takes to get ahead. Absolutely. All this stuff is way on the record. It's on the record for years in Minnesota and elsewhere lying about this and assuming no one's ever going to check. I mean, that's just the height of arrogance. I'll just, yeah. I'll get away with this. I could say whatever I want. You know, it's, it's all right. It's so, really so if the, if the goal of a VP candidate is to do no harm, let's rate the rollout, right? <laughs> Kelly, what, what, no, seriously, like what would you, because the left loves this guy. And, and we obviously, I mean, so give me just an honest, like, what would you say if you're team Harris and you're sitting back and you're saying, all right, she goes to you and says, all right, Kelly, how do you think the rollout of Tim Waltz has been? What's the grade you give it? I would give it, uh, and, and this is not because of anything the campaign has done. This is largely because of the mainstream media. No matter who Kamala Harris named as her VP this week, there was going to be glowing headla headlines about that person. Uh, she still, they still haven't scrutinized him nor her. She's had three weeks of going completely unscathed with the media trying to rewrite her history, say that she was never assigned to the border. She never was a border czar. She never opposed fracking. She never said that she never compared ICE to, uh, to the KKK. Like they're trying to totally rewrite her narrative and they have largely been very successful at that. And with Tim Waltz, he's America's granddad. Look at him, he's so folksy. He brings so much joy on the campaign trail. Yet neither one of these folks has sat down for an interview in over 19 days. And there is no pressing urgency from the media to even get an on the record quote or ask them any questions. When you have J.D. Vance on the same tarmac as Kamala Harris, and he is walking across that tarmac and, 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 and going to her press corps and just being like, listen, I feel sorry for you guys. He's doing interview after interview after interview. Trump is doing interview after interview, press conference after press conference. They're, they're, it, they have total, complete access to the Trump campaign, but this is a basement campaign that Kamala Harris and her team are running. But I would say, and I, I'm scared about this, I would say it's been largely successful because by and large, all the headlines have been glowing for Kamala Harris, and it's only the right-wing media who has pointed out all of these discrepancies in both his and her uh, record. Yeah, I want to just play. You you mentioned this. this is, I wanted to bring it up, so I'm glad you touched on this. Let me just show people what you're talking about. J.D. Vance, let's play the clip. His plane lands. They're both in Wisconsin. And he takes with the I think what the kids call this is a boss move. Right? <laughs> watch, let's, let's watch the video so that people can see this. So this is him walking over to her plane. President doesn't answer questions from reporters and hasn't for 17 days. 
All right. So, so like, I mean, look, he walks over to her plane. I mean, Kelly alluded to this and he basically says, Hey, I wanted to check it out. Plus you guys in the press corps that travel with her don't get to ask her any questions. I wonder if I can, you know, answer some or why you didn't, you notice that the press corps, when he asked them that question, they refused to answer. They were like, Oh God, now we're scared. Like you're right. We're not doing our job and you're calling us out. Mm -hmm. They probably sit there when, when he asked them, have, uh, have she give you any explanation for why she won't take your questions? They're probably in their mind. They're doing math, a math problem. Like if I say, if I answer truthfully, is that going to actually help him and Trump? I better not say anything. Well, they, they're, they're trying to figure out like, am I allowed to answer that question or well, I mean, right. you know, well, there's reports that Kamala Harris has indeed been accessible to her press corps that she gives off the record interviews with them all of the time while traveling on Air Force Two. And this is the chummy relationship that the Democrats and the press corps have, right? So long as the press that's traveling with her gets face-to-face -face time, they can't report anything she says, but so long as they can, you know, have a beer with her or, or get chatty, girlfriend chatty, they're, they're perfectly happy without having her go on the record or give a yeah, press that's conference all they really, or whatnot. That's all they, they really want. That's all they really want. And so, and so, it, she is a peer to them and they are a peer to her. It is, there's no adversarial relationship there at all. I was scouring the news before this to see who was actually covering the fact that she still has not sit, sat down for an interview at all. And, and neither has Tim Waltz. Obviously, that's been a shorter amount of time. But there's pretty much only even a select amount of conservative outlets who are even talking about this. I saw a Business Insider reporter tweet Kamala Harris should probably answer, probably answer more press uh, questions from the press. He's getting worried online, probably more. I mean, it's crazy. But to Kelly's point, it's just it's the second arm of uh, the Dem of the Democrat propagandists. So I, I think that it's great that J.D. Vance and um, Donald Trump are continuing to give these press conferences, give these interviews, give these gaggles, give as much access because that juxtaposition is eventually going to get to the egos of these journalists, which I think that's what it's going to come down to is these guys will eventually feel that their hand is forced and they have to get her to sit down for an interview. And when she does, my prediction is she will have Tim Walt sitting right next to her. He'll, she'll use him as a shield. She'll <laughs> use him to praise her, say she's the first, she's the best, she's everything. And hopefully he can be a little bit more articulate than she is, which isn't very hard. Does it matter? I mean, I, for all of us, I agree with you. This is insane. But to Kelly's point, if you've got a fawning press corps that writes stories about how you're amazing and Tim Waltz is America's granddad that they just didn't know, and they're a dynamic duo together, they've got happy swagger. I mean, like, <laughs> why would you risk it? I mean, honestly, if you're the person that comes to her and says, we should sit down and do an interview, I think they're going to fire them. They're like, are you kidding? Have you seen the press we get by doing nothing? Why would we screw this up? I, I, I get why we want her to do this and why she should do it and why the press is lame. But at the end of the day, if you're them, you're like, hey, this is kind of working. That's why I, I think, oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. That's why I think it's so important that Donald Trump do a debate with Kamala Harris. Because oh, yeah. there ah. is there is absolutely 100% they feel zero pressure to do any press interviews. This, she gives the same stump speech every single time she gets up to give it. She doesn't even give new speeches, right? They have her so scripted um, and the events so carefully choreographed. They know that the press will carry their water for them. So there's no urgency. There's no desire for her team to do these interviews where they know she's going to screw up because she hasn't done an unscripted interview without screwing up in her three years of be, being vice president. So the debate stage is where Donald Trump can expose these things. Um, and even though he might be reluctant to do them with ABC, this debate needs to happen because it's in his advantage to have her on that stage unscripted and to make her defend her previous statements, her policy positions, and her record, quite frankly, under the Biden administration. Yeah, you know, it's a joke that Kamala Harris is out there in the campaign and all the Democrats and everybody online saying that, oh, Donald Trump is afraid to debate her. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> First, the debate of, with Joe Biden is what ended Joe Biden's career. OK, so Donald Trump is not afraid. The guy just got shot. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. He popped up on stage and he pumped his fist. That's a he good went, point. he went, <clears throat> he went into the national association of black journalists into an absolutely hostile situation for him politically. And, and actually told them, look, this is the way I see the world. And this is why I think you guys are wrong though, to cover things the way you're covering it. And, and I don't like that first question and he fought back. He's not afraid. And yeah. so that, so they're, they're doing that because they, they don't have anything else to say really. And it's, it's their only logical attack, but this, never talk to the press, you know, I'm sorry to say it worked for Joe Biden, yeah. right? It helped him get yep. elected. We screamed all day long back in 2020 when I was the Trump communications director about the fact that he was hiding in his basement and the media didn't care and they never got access to the guy. And on one of the rare occasions that they did, a reporter who was at the time with the Washington Post now I think is with CNN, Edward Isaac Dovere or however you say his name, he stood up. He hadn't had access to the guy for months. He'd been hiding in his basement and something had happened that day. And his first question to Joe Biden after not seeing him for months was, what do you think this incident today says about Donald Trump's yeah, soul? I remember that. Right? Do you remember, remember that question? That. Yes, I do. Right? It's, so it's it slightly worked. better than the what kind of ice cream yeah. are you eating slightly from better. Ed O'Keefe of CBS News. So it worked for Joe Biden, right? He got elected by hiding. So they're obviously trying to replicate that playbook because she is a disaster. So it worked. He got in office. But what happened? What happened was when everyone he saw him in action, it proved that we were right in the first place. They were hiding Joe Biden because he was a mess and they're doing the same to Kamala Harris. They, and, and I hope, uh, God knows, I hope it doesn't work. But sooner or later, she's going to have to open her mouth, whether it's before or after the election. And everyone will realize that what we're saying right now is actually correct. All right. I want to I want to touch base on a, on a new topic, a new group of voters. There is at least in my opinion, an effort, and you guys correct me if you're wrong, if I'm wrong here, but by both campaigns to reach out to, to the Gen Xers. Am I got that right? I think Gen it's Xer. Gen Z. I'm Gen, Gen Z, Z now, Sean. <laughs> you're probably a Gen Xer. <laughs> uh, Gen I, can't, I feel like a, the, the, the way I feel these days, I feel like a baby boomer. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. But anyway, well, all right. Maybe it's so, the beard, Sean. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I don't Maybe that is it. Uh, <laughs> but, but let me just start with this. Um, the other day, I think it was Megan the Stallion, the uh, performer that got everyone to attend a Kamala Harris rally, um, posted that uh, Kamala Harris is brat. Okay, for the audience, Trisha, by default, you're the youngest. What does that mean? Explain to us what it means that she's brat. Because I think a lot of people are like, <laughs> is she a brat? Is she the brat? Like, Sean, what? I hate to correct you on your own show, but it was actually Charlie XCX, who was another ah, Gen Z performer. Brad is not only the name of her album, I believe, but it also means that you are a party girl. You tend to say some dumb things. You get a little messy, but you're still down to party. And so naturally for a presidential like campaign, it's... I guess it's kind of like fetch. I would say it's kind of like hot girl summer. Do you guys remember that from last year? Uh, yeah. Okay. But what is yeah. it, how is this good? How is, how is this relevant? This good? How is it Great good? How would it be positive? Him. She screws up and then she powers on because all she cares about is party. Exactly. How is that good? Because this whole, her whole campaign, because the media is letting it be, is all about vibes and virality. There's no substance. There's no policy. There's no answering tough questions on how you're flip-flopping from everything from fracking and reparations to uh, banning private health insurance because it's just vibes. It's just Kamala's laughter. Remember Tim Waltz continuing to say she's running on joy. Well, people in the United States aren't feeling a whole lot of joy right now when they're paying 20% higher uh, prices at the grocery store when they're facing immigration catastrophe. It is out of touch. And I think I know Americans are smart enough not to buy it. But, well, but are yeah. young people, I mean, like, why are you, I don't get this then. Okay, so it's like, you're the kind of fun girl that makes mistakes, but it's cool. So yes. why, to Tim's point, <laughs> maybe, does that resonate with young people? Like, it's like, hey, let's let's vote for her because she's not really good, but it's funny to watch. I don't, I, right now they're skating past some people not getting beneath the surface, right? I mean, what voters, what Republicans need to connect is that, one in three Gen Z is worried about their finances will lead to a problem of homelessness. We need to tap into that because right now they're saying, oh, Kamala looks kind of fun. It seems like the media is saying J.D. Vance is kind of a mean guy. I know Donald Trump's been villainized for a while, but this Kamala Harris don't know a lot about her, but her and her running mate apparently has big dad energy. So they're not connecting the fact that my <laughs> quality of life 
And my right, country so is worse off because of these policies. Tim, Tim, I want to put you back in your seat again. Let's let's just say that you reprised your role as communications director for the campaign. Okay. How do you answer this question about reaching out to young people? Does the Trump campaign say we got to be brat too? Do we try no. to be hip? Do we no. just talk about issues? What Kelly's shaking her head. Tim, tell me. I mean, I want both of you to weigh in. But Tim, you tell me right now you're back in your role. Donald Trump says, hey, Charlie X E X X C X doesn't right. think this is like, what do you do? Uh, well, I don't know that guy, Charlie, whoever that is. Woman. It's a she. Um, I know that much. Oh, okay. I was just kidding about that. That was, that was me trying to be funny. Sure you um, were. Yeah. Sure. Um, so no, they don't try to, you know, out brat her. That that's crazy. I'm I'm reminded, but you got you gotta try to uh send a message and, and talk to them about something that actually affects them personally, right? I tweeted something that Axios had a story about how Kamala Harris was set to go to some big dinner with a media mogul, a private dinner in someone's house while she was vice president. And she actually had staff stage a mock <laughs> dinner and people played the roles of the different people who were going to be at this dinner, dinner party. And they had a mock dinner party to help Kamala Harris prep for this dinner that she had to go to one night while she was VP. I will, I will, she wasn't some young kid. She was vice president, right? And so I posted about that and, and made fun of the idea that she needed to have a practice dinner. And everybody went crazy attacking me a bunch of lefties attacked me and said oh no that just makes her relatable i have work anxiety too and so it makes me feel oh you know, my i God. don't want i don't want the vice president of the united states to have work anxiety my god so but what that tells us is that you have to talk to them about something that does affect them talk about that talk about how much it costs them to fill up their car Talk about how much it costs to go buy, I don't know, what, a tube of Pringles or whatever Gen Z uh, voters eat, right? I don't know. Talk about it on, in some way that it actually affects them. Something they can go, oh, yeah, you know what? I experienced that yesterday, like the price of a gallon of gas. Trying to outbrat her. And if Donald Trump, that's not going to work. And so, wait, so Kelly, wait. he's reached out. I mean, he's reached out to the Nelk boys. He did this video the other day, which I thought was kind of cool. This guy, Aiden Ross, he's a huge following. Uh, he brought him one of the, the, the Tesla trucks, the cyber trucks. Uh, they did this thing where he sat in it, listened to music with them, got a ton of views. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you do more of that? Well, social media influencers, the, the, the Harris team is idolizing, utilizing theirs. I, so is Trump on, um, but uh, social media, I don't know how far that gets you. I think that the, just what Tim was saying. Uh, for the younger generation, and this has showed up in poll after poll, Gen Z is most concerned about home prices right now and the cost of a mortgage and never being able to buy uh, their first home, their starter home, because they've been priced out of the market. So I think Trump can especially talk on this issue, on, on how we're going to lower the cost of everything, how we're going to lower the interest rates, how we're going to lower the mortgage rates, how we're going to get you into your first home. And that all starts with, you know, becoming energy independent, uh, you know, basically unleashing uh, our dominance in that area, which is dependent on every energy is is largely what drove inflation. You know, Joe Biden's first days in office, shutting down the pipelines, uh, you know, taking back federal lands so that it couldn't be leased out to um, oil and gas companies. Uh, so, so I think that that is an issue where the Trump campaign can win and not only win, but identify, get these younger voters that have real concerns over, over their lives and what they're, you know, how they're, they're still living in their parents' basements, many of them, because they can't afford rents and they can't afford their first homes. So I think that's a good issue to kind of for the Trump campaign to delve into. That's why you should look out for the Fed to cut rates right before the election. Yeah, <laughs> but they're not yeah. political, Tim. They're not political. Oh, oh yeah, totally not political. <laughs> just, they've been through all this time, and what do you, what do you bet they cut rates like near the end of October? Yeah, Trisha, what should they do? What should the Trump campaign do? I think continue to do what they're doing. I think I do think keep JD Vance out there as the person who can talk to younger voters because it's not just Gen Z, right? It is the millennials. We are all dealing with the same issues. They just manifest itself in sometimes different ways depending on your different life stages. I I think that like going bypassing the media is what Donald Trump did brilliantly in 2016, right? Just going straight through Twitter. Obviously, that comes with some faults, but I think we need to continue to do that. And this 
when he has these press conferences, when J.D. Vance does these gaggles, there is some adversarial relationship there, as there should be. But right now, there's a Washington Post report that said seven in 10 voters don't trust the media to cover politics in a neutral way. The American people already don't trust the mainstream media. So bypass them in whatever way you can, whether it be podcasts, whether it be social media, or just go directly to them through these press conferences. Good call. Hey, I want to wrap as I like to do on Thursdays. Just give me, who do you think your winner of the week is and the loser of the week, Tim? Oh, man. Um, <clears throat> loser of the week. I'm going to go with that. Loser of the week is Kamala Harris for picking Tim Walls, uh, yeah. even even though that there's this the great fanfare of how awesome he is. And Jezebel, I, I want to point this out, Jezebel, oh, yeah. who's a feminist website. I don't I don't read it every single day, but, you know, most days, really. Um, they have a story up today that and the headline is for some women, Tim Walls is the dad that Fox News stole from them. So Jezebel sits, uh, sees uh, Tim Walls as a daddy figure. Well, isn't that curious? Back in 2016, they wrote precisely the same story about Tim Kaine. Democrat VP nominee Tim Kaine proves to be the DNC's increasingly charming dad. There you go. So they're always looking for a daddy Apparently figure. Apparently dads matter now. Uh, yeah, but only a dad who is not actually part of your family. Right? That's <laughs> it's like... All right. You know. uh, and the winner of the week, the winner of the week, I'm going to go with, uh, let's go with JD Vance. Yeah. I think okay. that I like, I like that walking up to Kamala's uh, plane yep. saying, Hey y'all, what are you guys doing? You want somebody to talk to? I'll talk to you. Pretty good. Kelly. Uh, I'm going to have to agree with the winner is JD Vance. Like he's yeah. had a, he had a rough entry um, as, as Trump's VP, but he has rebounded this week. He's doing every and any interview. He's unafraid to go into CNN or MSNBC and defend his stances, defend president Trump um, and our policies. So I think he's done terrifically this week. The loser of this week, losers, I'm going to say losers of this week are those two astronauts stuck in space. And, oh. and Boeing, they can't figure out how to bring them home. They've been up there for so long, and now they're hoping by 2025. This is a, a personal nightmare for me. A, space oh scares God. me. But, like, to be an astronaut, to go up there and then just be stranded and not knowing when you can right. go back into Earth's orbit is is, is just horrifying and really, really underreported. Yeah, can, can, can you imagine that call? Hey, guys, uh, are you sitting down? Got some bad news. <laughs> yes. yeah. All right, no, Trisha. we're in space. We don't. We can't sit down. Up here. I know. <laughs> I know. Trisha, the maniacal winner of the week is Nancy Pelosi. This Tim Walls uh, versus Josh Shapiro coup was was all hers. So oh, was the Joe great Biden call. coup. I, I, I mean, I think call. that she, she just had a book, The Art of Power, come out today. I mean, she, I actually just saw her on my train yesterday from New York to, to DC and she looks happy as happy as oh. can be. This is her, her uh, architecture at work. So yeah. she, she had a good week. Bloomberg has not had a good week from changing their, um, their profile from the early 2000s on Tim Walls. They talked about um, his service and that he served in Italy and they just changed it to show he served in Iraq. And then of course they broke the embargo on uh, the freeing of Evan and that, made a lot of journalists yeah, mad. Yeah. So their credibility is not looking too good these days. Yeah. I'm with you guys. Consensus wise, JD Vance, good week. Uh, Tim Waltz slash Kamala Harris, bad week guys. I always love these Thursday roundtables. Uh, so thank you for being here uh, tomorrow. Michael Knowles is going to join us from the daily wire. A lot to break down with him, including a blockbuster lawsuit that Elon Musk has filed on behalf of conservatives that really impacts conservative media and the advertisers uh, and you're going to want to hear why. we got that tomorrow. Please continue to subscribe. Hit that notification button in case we go live. But subscribe. YouTube, Rumble, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, we're always going to be kicking off the morning meeting right here on YouTube, 9 a.m. We'll see you back here tomorrow with Michael Knowles. Have a great night. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.